Welcome to the Together for Good podcast, a podcast specifically designed to inspire, challenge, and uplift you during your daily walk of faith. Today's episode, I sit down with my really good friend, Nick Strakowski. Nick is the director of Lutheran Youth of Western New York, which is a conference-wide youth ministry. Um, and I'm bringing Nick on to talk about something that he's been leading a lot of workshops about, something a, a youth ministry philosophy called Growing Young. It's something that some Bethany members might be familiar with, uh, as it was a book that we read as a faith formation team a little while back. But it's just really fascinating, and, and it, it allowed us to get into some really cool uh, conversations about what church really should be caring about, you know, what, what should be behind the things that we do as a church, what should influence our decision making, all that good stuff. Nick's just a delight. He's really fun to listen to. Uh, and I had a lot of fun chatting with him about all of it. So here we go, a conversation with Nick Strakowski about growing young. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Together for Good podcast. I am on the line with one of my dearest friends, Nick Strakowski. No, seriously, his last name is Strakowski. That's a mouthful. Uh, Nick lives in Buffalo, New York. He is the director of Lutheran Youth of Western New York, which is, well, Nick, why don't you tell us a little bit about what that exactly means and a little bit more about yourself, too? Well, hello, everybody. Nick here. Um, Yeah, so Lutheran Youth WNY is... uh, a conference-wide youth ministry for youth and families. So, you know, we have our uh, our whole USA of uh, ELCA churches, and then we have our regions, we have our synods, and we have our conferences. So I'm on the conference level, uh, which covers about uh, 30-ish churches. We've had some closures this year, but that's always not a bad thing. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, I cover about 30 churches, and we do uh, large-scale youth events, uh, now, hopefully, our confirmation program will start back up after COVID, and uh, we provide uh, continuing education programs for uh, pastors and youth leaders and congregations. So it's a pretty cool job. Um, yeah, and how long have you been doing it? You've been in this for a well, while. Well, now, yeah, now it's about four years. Um, we should let just, everyone out. So you were not in this job when I left Buffalo, New York. In fact, the job that you had right before I left Buffalo, New York, was <laughs> you were the secretary at the church I worked at. Yep, yep. I was yeah, the world most mediocre secretary. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, because I was, yeah, at the time, you know, that was what, you know, seven, eight years ago now, I was a part-time youth director at a church downtown and working at your old church Parkside as your secretary. And then, uh, so I was there for three, four years. So I was like in a congregation doing ministry for a while, you know, grew up uh, going to summer camp, working at summer camp as a counselor, and then moved into full-time youth ministry at Lutheran Youth uh, about four years ago. So Yeah, and Lutheran Youth, I mean, it's a really cool concept, especially for those who are listening. Here in Denver, we have lots of really big Lutheran churches. Um, in, in upstate New York, there are no big Lutheran churches. And so yeah. a lot of the churches in Western New York just can't support their own confirmation program. You'd have one student or something like that. And so something like Lutheran Youth, allows to hopefully gather that critical mass. That's one of the neat things. Well, and you kind of started the confirmation program, didn't you? Yeah, absolutely. And and it was, well, it was immediately compelling because we have to remember pastors are just people, just like the rest of us. And it's really awkward and hard to teach a class to one or two young people. It's, it's as somebody who's done it, it's the worst. So uh, <laughs> I, yeah, we saw the need and said, Hey, like, let's get together, you know, and then it alleviates a little bit off of the pastor's shoulders, but also, um, you know, brings the kids into greater community. It feels like something's actually happening, you know, as opposed to meeting this, uh, uh, this strange requirement at their home congregation. Yeah. Well, it, great. And so in, in addition to that, you've also kind of expanded out to not just focus on youth, but to then resource and equip some of the caring adults in different congregations so that they can have, you know, some expertise and, and some edu continuing education. That's kind of what you were also talking about as the other arm of Lutheran youth, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and this is, you know, this is, I'll, I'll make a disclaimer up front. Uh, you might hear things out of my mouth that sound like uh, deep cuts or critiques of uh, how church is pulled off, but really, um, it's all just seeing things that maybe aren't done the best and then showing up in ways that uh, yeah. can help that. Uh, but yeah, the 
for pastors and upper leadership in the church, there's uh, ministeriums, there's uh, built-in continuing ed, there's everything to the moon and back for support, and especially having a community. And that whole entire community will say that youth ministry is the basis of which our church is built, um, and then provide no funding, no, <laughs> no get-togethers, no uh, resources at all. So it's uh, to be able to provide community get-togethers and continuing ed programs for youth ministers. One, I think, validates the role as a professional role in the community. Sure. Uh, but also uh, prevents these leaders from feeling, feeling very alone in their ministries. I think youth ministers are, mm. are, tend to be very lonely, lonely types because it's like, oh, uh, they're just, they'll, they'll be over there with the kids. All right, we're going to go have a coffee. And I think it's, uh, it can get a little alienating sometimes. Not on purpose, of course. Nobody's doing anything malicious. Yeah, but you're right. There's just not a lot of those built-in systems and structures of support, of community and camaraderie. And so that's part of what you try to do, too, it sounds like, is get these youth directors, et cetera, together um, for education, but also just fellowship, too. Yeah, yeah, right? Because, like, you know, we say, you know, in church, we say that we are, uh, we're a community-oriented church, you know, we're, we're the whole the whole body of Christ thing, you know, it's like, uh, it's hard to feel inspired, feel energetic, feel compelled to do ministry if it really is just you. You know, I think yeah. church is such a collaborative process that when we end up breaking people off onto their own little islands, it, the ministry has actually become pretty unsuccessful. Yeah, that's so true. Yeah, just when it gets scattered and splintered and siloed like that, it's hard to, yeah, to know what other people are doing and, and to feel supported in your work. Like you said, that, that loneliness is a real thing. I know that's why I hired you as the secretary at the church is because I had been alone in that church for four years before that. Yeah, oh my <laughs> just God. just needed someone yeah. else to talk to. Um, yeah, yeah. But, well, I'm, I wanted to go over kind of the, the general structure of, of your role because it is pretty unique. And also a lot of these pieces that you're describing here really influence this initiative that you've been working on called Growing Young. Um, and yeah. I noticed it was on your website. The, the Lutheran, Lutheran Youth WNY is on the website there. It has a whole growing young tab. Well done. And, nailed it. Um, yeah, nailed it. <laughs> what's really cool is here at Bethany, um, I know that our faith formation team read that book, Growing Young. It's a whole kind of new philosophy as it relates to youth ministry in the church. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't actually get to read it. They read it right before I arrived, but I'm at least familiar with it. But wanted you to just tell us a bunch more about this concept, about this philosophy. Um, and, and yeah, I'm sure they'll get us to some cool uh, angles and topics of conversation. So just give us a, a brief overview to start. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think you said it great. You know, it's uh, gr Growing Young is a philosophy around youth ministry, not a youth ministry program. You know, because over the years, uh, there has been countless, countless, countless uh, youth ministry programs, uh, you know, these all-in-one packet things, you know, for three easy payments of nineteen ninety nine, we can get you a youth ministry that'll have them just pouring out the windows, which never has worked ever. Otherwise, I would be using one of those right now. <laughs> uh, so it, yes, it's less about building a program. <laughs> it's more about shifting church culture away from how we view youth ministry now uh, and shifting that, that viewpoint into something that uh, has been proven to work by a lot of research, a lot of interviews, a lot of time, you know, and the cool thing about growing young is that the best the, the, the thing I say before any presentation is that these aren't my ideas. You know, these are ideas uh, out of Fuller Youth Institute out in uh, California yeah. there at Fuller Seminary and extremely well funded. Oh, my gosh. Amazing staff. Um, and it's something like over 10,000 hours of research, over like 1,200 or 1,400 interviews in 40 something states all around the country, all flavors, all types uh, to figure out why young people would ever want to step into a church building or be around a church ministry. Because uh, the reality that we face now, I think in modern culture, is that uh, the internet age has enabled uh, absolutely amazing things in the church. Uh, it's also enabled people with uh, undesirable uh, theologies. I'm not saying they're wrong. I'm saying they may be undesirable for me. Uh, yeah. Very, very easy to distribute those kind of theologies. Theologies that say we aren't good enough unless we do certain things. 
theologies say that God is interested in restriction, that God is interested in making sure he knows you're doing something wrong. So I think what has happened is uh, yeah. young people spend a great deal of time on social media and on internet culture, and they're receiving these messages of Jesus. So why would Jesus be a good, compelling word for youth ministry if all they tend to hear about Jesus in the mainstream is, you know, oppression, critique, pain, anger, it's, you know, it's, it's hard, you know. So the idea uh -huh. of growing young is that we build a youth ministry, one, around healthy theology, Jesus-centered theology, uh, and uh, create a compelling way of talking about the gospel that feels grounded and feels actually applicable to life. Uh, and this is the hilarity of it all, too, is how many times have you and I probably both said that exact sentence? You know, like, <laughs> like, oh, uh, let's create a youth ministry that's grounded in the gospel. It sounds really good to them. Yeah, it's like, you know, and I say that in my presentations, too. It's like, we've all kind of said this before. It's uh -huh. like, but I think we've said it in a way that um, was missing what Growing Young brings to the table. Growing Young brings actually the real, the filling to the pierogi, if you will. I'm from Buffalo and Poland. <laughs> it's a pierogi. So, so grow, you know, we had the beautiful crispy shell, but now Growing Young uh, actually brings the cheesy, meaty, uh, yummy <laughs> filling in there. No, and, it, potato. and I think that's so important, right? Like the, the research-backed element. I heard a, a great phrase the other day. Someone said to me, he said, in God we trust, but everyone else has to bring research. And I think yes. that's, that's a great, we, and I think as the church, we're often, we often just are, are very leery of business mindset type of things. It's like, oh, like the church is a business, but not really, right? Like we're, we're, we're something different than that. So we don't want to get polluted with all this business jargon and philosophy. And yet in the same sense, like we can't just rely on good ideas, um, it, it just doesn't work like that anymore to just no, be like, you know man. what, like it's going to be gospel centered and I have an idea about how that will work. We could, I mean, the world's so complicated and, and people's lives are so much different than they were even when you and I were growing up, Nick. And yeah. so there's all these factors that we just don't even know how to account for, but that research can at least help us account for. And so that's what I, I mean, like, I'm really big on this now of just trying to, whenever I can find things like growing young that are really based in hours and hours of, uh, of substantial research to kind of inform the decisions that we make, um, that just always seems like a win to me. And so you're, you're right, like we've, we've had the, the, the nice shell, but we've all just been guessing at what to put in the middle of the pierogi. And so it's like, oh, let's, let's throw some paper in there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, it, it shifts the conversation from should we go bowling or should we go play laser tag to should we be, uh, you know, reaching out in certain ways, talking about scripture should be, should we be teaching the congregation certain ways to interact with kids? You know, it's like, it stops being about what we're actually doing on the surface level and more about what's happening on the back end. Cause yeah, I love, yeah, exactly. I completely agree with you. Like, you know, research creates a level of, of objectivity that makes it a lot easier to sell these ideas. Uh, not that they really even need to be sold, but um, the research brings something else to the table that uh, a lot of other things don't. And a big thing that research showed was uh, uh, the, the issue in the room is not uh, modern social media culture. The issue in the room is not uh, necessarily theology. Uh, the issue in the room is uh, church culture, you know, and, and church culture is something that is learned, you know, generation by generation. So, uh, you know, we learned a certain way of how to interact with young people and, and young people learn a certain way of how they interact with the community. And the, big, the biggest thing that Growing Young uh, talks about is that Growing Young is, like I said before, not about creating a new youth program. The Growing Young is about shifting church culture. So, so not only are we talking about, yeah, like connecting with young people better, but we're talking about building a congregational and a church community that's more functional overall. And the byproduct of that is it being more compelling to young people? Is it being better at forming more meaningful relationships? Is there something successful going on? You know, it's uh, so they kind of found like that linchpin of church culture. And I think that's really cool. That's really interesting because I don't think we recognize either, um, especially if you've been steeped in church culture, 
you know, and whatever culture you're steeped in, you never recognize how weird it is to an outsider. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and church culture is substantially weird um, to an outsider. Uh, I mean, especially when you just think about if you had never been to church before and, you know, the pastor gets up and like chants these words and then says, this is my body. This is my blood. Like that would be terrifying if you yeah. have no context for uh, it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just as a really stark example. Um, so yeah, tell us a little bit more about w- what it kind of starts to look like then when, when you implement it, what, what are the, some of these changes to the church community that can be more effective for um, connecting with youth? Well, the, what I like about the growing young thing is through all the research and through all this stuff, uh, they've built something called the growing young wheel. So there's uh, distinct pathways and distinct things to talk about and teach about within your community that will end up with your church uh, shifting church culture and growing young, as we say. Um, so the first thing that, that you got to do, it's, it's about, um, uh, let me pull, up, pull it up really quick here, actually. Um, Because you said your minister does something like this, right? Correct. Yeah, Brian Jaster has like led the congregation through, or the team, his youth, his faith formation team. Okay. Through reading this book, and I know that he has a lot of these ideas back in in the back of his head as he's planning everything. So I'm sure he's listening too. Hi, Brian. Hey, Brian. We know you're there. (laughs) Brian, you'll have to email me and tell me if I'm wrong. No, it, that's what's kind of cool about growing young too is that there it leaves room for context. You know, the 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 biggest thing about growing young is is like all these steps that I'm about to talk about happen within your specific context. So they uh, can morph and shift and change to meet the needs of wherever you're at. Because yeah, like your church in you know magical Colorado with like seven you worship seven trillion. What is it? Seven million. <laughs> So, Compared to here, it basically feels that way. Well, um, I mean, and after the pandemic, who knows what the numbers are anymore? Yes. Yeah. But and then, you know, to other, a church over out here in our like third ring suburb of Akron worshiping nine, you know, like, yeah, it's going to look a little different in your church council and stuff. Uh, so the first part of growing young is it's all about keychain leadership. Uh, I'll say that keychain leadership. So it's uh, power in, in a lot of places, specifically church and probably business, uh, power actually comes quite literally with the ability to open doors, you know, open the business, close the business, get into the storage locker, get into the safe, et cetera. So the more keys you have, the more responsibility you have in that community and the more reason you have to be there. Uh, so the whole idea of keychain leadership is that uh, pastor or who or church council, whoever's, you know, really leading the community at the time is finding leaders within the congregation that have keys. So the First, you identify leaders that hold responsibilities, and then you identify the leaders among that that are willing to share those keys. And then you link those leaders that want to share keys up with young people that seem to be ready and willing to take on these roles and responsibilities within the community. And like, yes, that does appear like, you know, little Jack is going to help out Kimberly with the church picnic and the setup. And like, it seems so uh, simple on the outside. And that's what we always would do, right? The kids help out, blah, blah, blah. But it's different when the kids help out with intentionality. You know, it's like with the, with, the elite, with the leader actually recognizing what they're doing is more than just asking little Jack to put plates on the table. They're teaching a young person how to show up and behave and contribute to a greater community. Uh, so, yeah. So one of the yeah. things that we're doing here, we're, we're revamping, you know, post-COVID, we're kind of relaunching a lot of a, a whole new way of being this fall in terms of our youth education and Sunday mornings, et cetera. And one of the things that we've been talking about internally is trying to come up with 100 jobs for different people to do, to just feel a part of it, to feel that buy-in with it all. And we're not going to, you know, like we're just calling it a hundred jobs is because it sounds nice. Um, there might not actually end up being a hundred jobs when this is all said and done, or there could be more, but just finding those things like, all right, who can we ask and what could we specifically um, empower them to be in charge of? Is that kind of what you're talking about here? Yeah, exactly. And it's, it's putting, it's putting young people in charge of things that actually they uh, can mess up. I think that's the key. The key part of keychain leadership is that we must be putting young people in positions where they can mess up and not feel immediately alienated. You know, it's uh which I guess kind of goes without saying, but again, it's part of that intentionality. It's like, that is one of the good things about church culture. I'll say is that oftentimes you can mess up 
and it's not a big deal. Like I remember my yeah. daughter, Evelyn, you remember Evelyn, you know, Evelyn. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah of course. <laughs> she, uh, she was one of the readers on a Sunday morning. She was reading the first, the old, old Testament passage and she started to get really nervous. And I told her, I'm like, Evelyn, like it's a church. No one's like, even if you make a mistake, no one's going to care. Mm-hmm. She's like, Oh yeah, you're right. <laughs> and she was totally fine with it afterwards. Yeah. So yeah. Um, that it's one of the, I'll just say like, shout out to church culture. It's one of the things I think we do well is we tend to be pretty, uh, forgiving and gracious of smaller mistakes. Yes. Yeah. And I, and that leads perfectly into that next step on the, on the whole growing young wheel thing, you know, go, so it goes from keychain leadership to empathy today. So then it becomes like, a you're putting young people in roles, uh, that are meaningful with an, with an older person in the congregation. Uh, that's, you know, set up and, and knows what's happening. Uh, and then it sets them up to learn about uh, the empathy we have in the church, that Evelyn can go up to the front, mm-hmm. uh, do the reading, make a mistake, and still be loved. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, so it's, it's really like it starts with plugging people in in meaningful ways in the community, or plugging people in in meaningful ways in the community to then have them set up to learn all about the fact that here... We love each other anyways. You can come in the room even after you broke the plate, et cetera. You know, it's, there, there's something, again, it's always that thing is that there, there's something more going on than uh, the act of helping out. And unless you are doing those things, knowing what's happening intentionally, it's, it gets really uh, empty pretty quick. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, because the, that's that's the the biggest thing I say in my presentations about growing young is that yes, it's about young people, um, but actually, my interpretation of it is it actually is more about the older people in the community. Um, it's more about educating and empowering the older people in the congregation uh, to be key sharing leaders that teach young people about the empathy that our community shares, uh, and that's compelling for young people. The research says that it is compelling for young people to be around adults that are not their parents, that are not their teachers, like third party adults, if you will, that show them connection, love and compassion. Uh, The research Mm. says that some of the most successful young people in the U S have meaningful relationships with three other adults besides their parents and immediate teachers. So, um, and I'm trying, and this is something like now that you have children, a bunch of children. Oh my gosh. Um, (laughs) It's, there's not many places I think in our society where it's appropriate to have relationships with older people um, in, in meaningful, intimate ways. Like we do at church. Like, you know, if you play on a soccer team uh, yes, you go to your soccer team's party and stuff and like hang out with your coach and say goodbye for the season. But you're not going to like as a 12, 13 year old, 14 year old, go and grab lunch with your coach and like drink coffee and like chat. It's like maybe in some places, yes, but I'd say a lot of the time it, it's not necessarily appropriate and not necessarily a place where that can really happen. But church provides a space where uh, we actually can do that safely because there's you know a leadership structure, but also because we're we're rooted in a community that is uh, literally supposed to do that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, yeah, it's one of the there. the only. Um intergenerational communities left in the world it seems like yeah yeah and that's the that's what i loved about the 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 original presentation i went to with with jake who's one of the leads on the project uh and that's what that's what he said he's like this is uh i think the last this is the alamo for young people on some level like church is the is the space where we can do things with young people that are not offered anywhere else and to sort of go back to what I said initially is like, yes, we have all these leaders that say youth ministry is the centerpiece of our communities. This is what builds up good churches and all the research says it and everybody knows it, but there's no resources going to it. There's no actual commitment, you know, and and the best thing Jake said in the presentation, he said, your budget sheet is a perfect summary of your priorities. Um, And obviously there's more to ministry than finances. But as somebody that runs a budget for years, yeah, it needs a bunch of money. <laughs> like you actually do need resources to pull it off. So um, I think part of this growing young thing, especially now that we're doing it synod wide, the back end goal is to convince leadership and synod leadership and the bishop that 
this is something that actually requires resources to pull off to hopefully yeah. end up with what we need to uh, affect some real change. So um, be be a little more specific. What uh, how would you uh, what what types of financial resources would uh, support something like this? Like what would it look like? Rather than just saying, like, oh, yeah, we need money, but like to do <laughs> uh, Well, I think the number one thing, I'm actually going to be, uh, we just got a new bishop around here. So um, he starts. Yeah, your former, your former boss too, right? Yeah, which I think is a good thing. I, it's probably a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's probably a good thing. Uh, but no, it's uh, in September, he's going to begin, uh, you know, taking ideas and pitches for, you know, assistant to the bishop roles and stuff. But I, I really feel that uh, there should be a, um, uh, like a, I'm trying to think of the better language. You know, we've, we've used language like youth advocate and all this stuff, but I do think there needs to be an assistant to the bishop that specifically works on uh, shifting youth ministry culture in the synod by providing workshops, by doing church visits, by integrating those things into uh, synod ministeriums with, with, with pastors. Uh, I want to stick with Growing Young mostly because the resources they provide are completely insane and amazing. Uh, yeah. But also I want to stick with Growing Young because I actually believe it. You know, it's, it's something that when I finally heard somebody talk about youth ministry in the way that Jake was talking about it in that workshop, it was like completely insane. You know, it is insane to see. So yes, I, I would I I would go so far as to say that I think the synod should take on a full time staffer that absolutely uh, builds uh, uh, networking events and continuing at events for um, youth leaders. Helping churches understand this. Yeah, these yeah. It's like it's it's to where there needs to be somebody to call. You know, and I think right now, like, even I don't have anybody to call. I'm the one that people call, and I don't know what's going on. <laughs> I'm just sort of here, like, you know. Uh, but I, I think it starts with having somebody to call, you know, yeah. as a leader. Um, well, so, okay, you talked about keychain leadership. You talked about the empathy. Are there other pieces to the magical wheel? Yeah, the Before cool. we get to sidetracked, yeah. Yeah, which is, you know. That's how so, we work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we, we go from keychain leadership into learning about empathy and experiencing empathy today. And then after that, uh, the research says that one of the most important things of uh, really meaningful, successful ministries around young people is, is it being Jesus centered, which is, I think the most hilarious part of it all is that it took, I'm assuming a huge amount of money and a huge amount of time to realize that, you know what, there's something uh, pretty good happening here with this gospel thing. It's like, uh, but no, that's, but that's like where some level of theology, yes, comes in. You know, it's, it's, uh, you're giving these young people meaningful ways to plug in. You're hooking them up with leaders and people in the community that are teaching them about empathy and the inclusive nature of our communities. And then after all that primer, I think the young person's heart is actually open and ready to hear more about what Jesus is saying because they're experiencing this, this, this uh, really deep, uh, in the moment way of yeah, uh, the well, and, church. And then they actually start learning about where in the world these things come from. I'm super biased, but I think that this is really important, right? Yeah. It's the, only essential, right? Yeah. And, 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 but, and it's easy to lose sight of it because we, we constantly want to focus on like, we think that youth ministry has to be really, really fun. And, and, you know, and like, that's a good thing. Yeah. We want the kids to be enjoying themselves, <laughs> Yeah. Um, but when you just focus on that, I've seen youth ministry where it just the, the Jesus piece gets lost. And so yeah. now all of a sudden, if you don't have the Jesus piece, like that's something irreplaceable. You know, this gift that we have to give people that, can, you know, speaks to their body, mind and soul on mystical levels. Um, and, and and we should care about that. And, and it's inspired and, and allowed people to build their lives around following Jesus for thousands of years, right? Like there's something more going on with all of that. Um, and, and, and yet we uh, seem to be afraid of it or, or we seem to think that, oh no, like kids don't want that. Like we need to entertain them. Well, and yeah. so then when you, when you do the entertainment thing, like now you're in the entertainment business and you're going to lose because an iPhone is way more entertaining than anything else you could possibly yeah. come up with for youth ministry. Like this is just, it, it just, it happens in the church, not just in youth ministry either. 
you know, we, we, we get so caught in gimmicks and being like, oh, like we got to find a gimmicky way to get people to come to church. It, Cause, and that just strikes me as thinking that we don't actually believe in what we have to give as being any good. <laughs> oh, oh, completely. And it sort of tracks back to what I said initially is like, uh, when when our current generation thinks of cool and fun, I don't think Jesus comes to mind. You know, and that's because I think there's like a little bit of a there's a cultural air around the Jesus thing. You know, yeah. and uh, what's super interesting is yeah that we do feel we have to be gimmicky and have to be showy and entertaining in order to like sell the Jesus thing. It's like, see, told you it was fun and cool, uh, but really. Uh, young people, all the research has kicked back to show that young people genuinely resonate with the message of love and compassion and inclusion that Jesus gives. The research also kicked back that when theology is more exclusive, when theology is more um, uh, sort of transactional, there, there's uh -huh. like a transactional nature to it, that does not land. So um, yes, there's theology-specific things happening in this process, but I just feel confident that the gospel you and I both read talks a heck of a lot about love, compassion, patience, kindness, acceptance. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And when and when you build this trusting, meaningful relationship with this young person, like we said, like through uh, through plugging them in, through learning about empathy, there's a actually it's like Velcro, you know. There's actually something for it to stick to now, as opposed to like, hey, little Jack, have you ever heard about Jesus? It's like, ah, get away from me. <laughs> uh, like, hey, meaningful leader I've known for a few months now that I've done stuff with that I enjoy that showed me love. Oh, let's have like a conversation about faith. You know, that's way different, you know, yeah. uh, than, you know, singing, uh, you know, baby shark up front and doing spins, which is also really fun, but um, <laughs> maybe not exactly what we're going for. Maybe not. <laughs> Yeah. So then. Yeah. So, and it's a weird balance, too, of like, you know, because you and I both love camp. I, I worked at camp. You you still work at that camp sometimes, right? Weren't yeah. you just there? Yeah. Uh, I was just there. Got back last week. I am a potato, but that's okay. <laughs> and camp, camp has some of those like fun elements to it. Yeah. Um, which is fine. Like we're, I'm not, I'm not anti fun, but just like we have to believe that we have something more to give than entertainment. And gimmicks. Ugh. Yeah. Anyways. Well, and that's like some of the, as I've gotten a little older, you know, I'm 31 now and I, I've been going to camp since I was 11, started working there as a counselor when I was 19. So when, when I was 19, 20, 21 there working as a counselor in the summer, I thought the Bible studies and worships were lame. They were square. They were boring. Oh, it's so dumb. Why do we make the kids do this? Um, and now that I'm a little bit older, talking with the young people that are at camp all the time about what they did for Bible study, how they did, they actually really like it. <laughs> this whole time, I thought these kids were so bored and, and just hated everything I was saying and weren't even hearing it. And now I'm kind of <laughs> on the outside asking these cabin groups, like, hey, what'd you go over with your counselor in Bible study? And they're like, oh, they weren't like, oh, we read Second Timothy and blah, blah, blah. It's, they're like, oh, we made a drawing and we just talked about how uh, it's our job to make sure everybody has a seat at the table. It's like, you know, this is a nine-year-old saying it. And I'm like, okay, that literally makes the world better. You know, it's, <laughs> it's something where, yeah, I, I agree with you. I don't think we fully accept what we have to offer. Yeah. Um, and so, so, yeah, so we have keychain leadership. We've got, that moves into empathy today. That moves into being Jesus-centered around uh, the gospel and the message. And what happens after that is um, showing how the community itself emulates uh, sort of Jesus-centered relationships. We call it warm relationships. So now that the young person is plugged in meaningfully, they've interacted with somebody with real empathy, they've learned a little bit about Jesus, now they're starting to get more involved in the greater community. And they're starting to learn what it's like to have warm, loving relationships with others. You know, so it's, yeah. I think the cool thing about growing young is that yeah, it's sort of this like intellectual process of shifting church culture, but it's also kind of this pathway that young people can take uh, to have something really meaningful in their life. Because uh, I mean, for me, you know, church community has been, you know, the centerpiece of my entire life. And uh, I think there's negatives and positives and everything all around to that. But um, luckily, I was surrounded by leaders that at least stuck with somewhat of this pathway, you know, and it sort of happens automatically. 
uh, but it doesn't happen without leaders being intentional. Yeah, well, intentionality is such a key piece to all of this too. Well, I mean, okay, hang on. Um, let's keep moving though. Um, so the warm relationships makes perfect sense, kind of like emulating the Jesus-like relationships. And I, I like too how in talking about this wheel, you're saying mm -hmm. that it's, it's it sort of has a progression to it. You know, you can't just jump to warm relationships um because yeah, there's kind of exactly. got to be some pieces that that predate it but so then i'm assuming there's more spokes to this wheel aren't there six i believe uh yeah just a couple more just yeah, keep going more <laughs> no no so yeah so the, essentially the, like this is the so the young person's involved in all the ways i just said and they, <clears> they're, they're finding ways to uh, show up in these warm meaningful relationships in their community they feel involved they feel great and this is where is sort of the the V in the in the trail, you know, the the split in the trail. It's that we can go, oh, look at us, we got this young person involved, you know, all done. Let's let's uh, pack up and get out of here. Um, if that happens, the the research showed that uh, young people tend to stop showing up, uh, and older people also stop showing up because they don't have uh, anyone to mentor or any meaningful relationships happening. Uh, in, in, in ways more than what they just show up for. So after warm relationships, we move into uh, teaching the church as a whole and especially church council to prioritize young people everywhere. So it's almost like the young people get involved, get involved deeply and intimately in this community. And that's almost required in order to convince the older generation that it's actually okay to start moving more resources into young adult and youth ministries, to start... Uh, having more events to start recognizing leaders that did connect with the young people and maybe empowering them to do more. Uh, it's all about prioritizing those, those young people everywhere possible. And yeah, it does look like, yeah, having Evelyn read. It does look like having people help uh, ushering or seating or passing out something during service for a sermon illustration or something. It all does look like that, but it also can look like uh, helping actually plan for events. Like, you know, you got a 15, 16 year old kid that helped with the church picnic last year. And now the next one's coming up. Let's, let's have that kid actually make a decision, you know? Yeah. And it's one of those things where I, I watch my, my boss Lee Lindemann at camp do it all the time. He's the camp director and I am watching just a counselor, like a 19, 20 year old counselor, just bomb just <laughs> they're, they're trying to do a sermon it is a nightmare <laughs> nobody has any idea what's going on it is like they're nervous and shaking and it's awkward i'm awkward and then you know it all finishes up and, and lee debriefs it all and lee goes you know i it's like it's like let's try focusing more on just like one thing but i really thought you did a great job and i thought i can't wait for you to get up there again and i looked at them like no, don't ever let them do that again. But that's me, that's me being a hypocrite because Lee is interested in getting people up there that can, you know, fail reasonably, but then getting them back up there again to actually grow a leader and grow somebody in this community. Um, so shout out to Lee Lindemann for actually doing the right process because that's prioritizing them everywhere. It's like, no, 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 no. Just because it didn't go perfect this one time, you're still important, you're still a priority, you're still involved in this part of this uh, community. So, um, yeah, and then the last thing on the wheel is after we make sure we prioritize youth everywhere is um, learning how to be the best neighbors. So it's like, it comes sort of full circle. It's like, then as a young person involved in this community in a deeply intimate way that feels prioritized everywhere, how then does the young person be the neighbor for more young people coming in. Be a good neighbor for the older people that need help. Be a good neighbor in their lives and beyond. Um, and I think growing young, yes, shifts church, church culture, which I think is extraordinarily important. Yes, growing young provides meaningful youth ministry. But at the end of the day, behind it all, and why youth ministry has always been compelling to me, is that we are creating more compassionate, empathetic young people in a world where um, that is not not the norm. <laughs> uh, yeah. and, even, and, and that's the thing, like we don't live in a bad world. I'm not, I, I'm not cynical enough to say that yet, <laughs> but I, I, we don't live in a bad world, but we live in a world that functions on far different value <laughs> than Jesus centered community. So when you have somebody that's in the room, that's less apt to jump on the bandwagon of bullying somebody that's less apt to jump on the bandwagon of sheer brutal negativity about how the world is, um, that actually shifts not only church culture, but I think uh, our, our greater culture. 
Uh, yeah. So it's fun. I mean, the I was just talking with Brian Jester, our youth director here. He had just gotten back from going to one of the camps out here in the Denver area. He was at Rainbow Trail. And he was telling me how the philosophy there, like that the camp director instills in all the counselors and, and, you know, like the whole way that they try and operate as Rainbow Trail Lutheran Camp is to help kids, uh, you know, they do things differently so that kids will be different in the world Mm -hmm. um, when they leave camp, which I think is a really like that's exactly what you're talking about, too, is that all of this can have an impact. And we send people then out into their communities to be, as you said, the best neighbors possible. Um, so that they've been introduced to a different way of carrying themselves in relationship with others. And then that slowly and subtly completely changes the world that they live in and the communities that they inhabit. So it's, you know, it's a, that's really cool. Like, it's a very powerful vision for what youth ministry can be, too, isn't it? Like, I think oftentimes it's like, no, we just want to have like kids in church. It's like, no, no, no. Like, we want to raise a new generation to make the world more in line with the ways of Jesus. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and and it's like shifting on some level the youth ministry model from seeking and weeding out pastors to uh, seeking, (laughs) you know, a better world. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with, you know, uh, uh, fostering leadership. Oh, my gosh, that's required, too. But maybe not while we're trying to teach young people how to not be jerks. <laughs> we can teach adults yeah, how not to be yeah, yeah right it's like <laughs> yeah. good for everybody but no i think um i do think that you know there's something we've been working on on this other church project i'm on is talking about is faith relevant you know and i think that's such an interesting question because you know we all struggle uh-huh. with faith on some level uh and as i'm seeing how less and less culturally relevant jesus is uh in in many circles not all circles of course but um it makes me wonder, like, is faith actually relevant? And learning about growing young taught me that, yes, it absolutely is. Because, yes, you can send a kid to a leadership camp, and they will come back stronger, more confident, ready to be more awesome people. I will never, ever deny that. Uh, but what I think the gospel and the whole Jesus thing brings to the table is that uh, we're connecting with something uh, that is, like you said before, mystical. We're, we're not only teaching kids life skills about how to be in community and teaching kids about love and compassion, but we're teaching kids how to have uh, open minds, open hearts, and uh, an openness, right? Because like faith is a mystical thing where we have to be inherently open to these ideas that might not entirely make sense. And that's the whole sort of beauty of mysticism and the whole idea of faith for me. So I think we're teaching kids not only great life skills and compassion, but we're also teaching them ways to think in open, critical ways, to think in ways that uh, go beyond the intellect. You know, and I think to remove all of society from just thinking intellectually and just what makes pragmatic sense is one of the most important things we can do. Because uh, pragmatic, uh, as we see in many situations, pragmatism uh, usually ends up hurting some people. Because, <laughs> you know, <laughs> the bottom line or whatever, like whatever that line, but no, I... Yeah, it, no, exactly. It's it's loving people, which is the church's job. Yeah, absolutely. Over and above all these other distractions that we get caught up in. Um, Nick, this is amazing. You're you're super smart. I always knew that, and I really thank you for sharing this wisdom with us. Uh, you've given us a lot to think about. Anything? Any any closing remarks before we sign off here? Well, first of all, your your youth minister's name is Brian. Mm-hmm. Brian, if I'm wrong, it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> Brian has incredible empathy. He's, yeah. He's okay. Well I'll look it up. In We're in already doing it. No, but it's. Uh, I guess the last thing I'll say is that I, I, church, I think represents yes, an institution of faith, but I think church also represents a way of seeing reality that um, I hope never goes away. I think uh, living living in the world through Christ consciousness, through the eyes of empathy and compassion. Uh, increases our quality of life, but also uh, creates more opportunities for growth, healing, everything all around us. So, and I think growing young helps with that. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Thanks for that, Nick. Well, thanks for your time. I'm going to bring you back on again, because there's so many things that we can talk about, but I wanted to get your expertise on this. I really appreciate you taking the time and to you loyal listeners. Thanks for listening to this as well. Um, Yeah. Growing young and finding ways to, 
uh, create a church community that uh, helps raise a new generation in the ways of Jesus. That's what we're about. That's um, part of our calling and part of our mission here. So thanks for listening, everyone. Stay in peace.